Hello and welcome to Your City. I'm your host, Lynn Turner Fitzgerald. Police Chief Rich St. John is joining me today. I want to thank you for being here, Chief. Thank Always you. a pleasure. Thanks for having me. We're going to do kind of a broad stroke overview of what's going on with the Billings Police Department today. Uh, I looked at the crime report from 2023. Um, some of it was a little shocking to me, but the other thing I noticed is that the years 20 and 21 really spiked a lot of crime and criminal activity. Yeah, and of course that was uh, COVID years, and we were struggling with um, a justice system that essentially shut down. Uh, right. We had criminals that uh, could not be put in jail, and it didn't take them long to figure out that uh, they could operate with relative impunity. And so uh, we saw a lot of uh, violent crime uh, spike. We saw a lot of property crime spike and uh, and really struggled with it. And we were no different than any other uh, city in the country. You were seeing the same sort of trend. Uh, as we get through the uh, the COVID situation and the justice system reengages, we are able to start holding uh, those those individuals accountable. Uh, they're you know we're, we're certainly uh, you know having difficulties then as now with right. a, an overcrowded jail situation, but we were able to get people in front of a judge, in front of their uh, probation officer, uh, and start to turn those number down uh, numbers down. Yeah. So the last couple of years. I've uh, been very, very proud of the work that's been done uh, that across the board, uh, downward trend, which is where we want to go in most all categories, whether it was violent crime uh, or, or uh, property crimes. Okay. If you had to say, what, what do you think is the number one problem that your department faces in Billings? Well, um, we, break, we break our priorities down into uh, crimes uh, of violence, mm -hmm. crimes against persons, and then property crime. Uh, crime uh, violent crime most definitely is the most pervasive, the, the highest profile. Um, it is affecting our citizens' quality of life, uh, specifically whether you've been a victim yourself or whether you are perceived that it's not safe. Uh, we constantly hear about um, individuals who don't want to move their family here, who don't want to uh, uh, bring a business into town, um, who are moving out of the downtown corridor, out on the west end where, uh, where it's more safe. Uh, and that's all because of, uh, you know, a couple of things. We did have, uh, we did have some serious uh, criminal activity take place on, and violence specifically. And then again, we really struggle with, uh, with the media coverage on the, on the constant uh, front page, constant uh, story over and over and over again, and, and that just um, exacerbates some of the situation that we're dealing with. Uh, but that being said, our number one issue that we're dealing with uh, is domestic violence. In 2023, 60% of all assault cases that our officers handled, whether it was a misdemeanor version, a felony version, or strangulation case, was domestic in nature. Uh, and that is a very, very difficult thing for um, our officers to prevent unless they're present when something's taking yeah. place. And so uh, we arrest plenty of, uh, of offenders. And the impetus has really been to um, work programs to break the cycle of violence. I've been at this long enough, uh, you know, I'm starting to see generational um, situations. It's past mm -hmm. being the, you know, the son, the grandson. Uh, but the question that people have to ask is where did this young man learn it was okay to strangle their spouse or hit their spouse or raise a hand? Uh, well, dad did it, so it must be, the, must be acceptable and that's the way to do it. Yeah. And so um, aside from the enforcement side, what we really want to focus on is, is prevention and intervention, which of course needs to take community involvement, yeah. and we need to get at them very young, which which now involves bringing uh, the schools to bear. Uh, and we had great, great cooperation and partnership with S, uh, SD2 mm -hmm. on trying to develop programs to do just that. So the violent crime is certainly a concern, and that's the one that really, when you look at our numbers um, for aggravated assault, really tips the scale and makes it look bad. Uh, but it's a, it is bad. It, it is bad. Yeah. Serious situ uh, right. Serious serious cases, 
Um, however, they're, they're difficult to deal with because they take place behind closed doors right. for the most part. Um, obviously, we, uh, we had a, a serious issue with, uh, with some gangs that uh, popped up here. Uh, they've always been around, but they've never... Are you talking about the youth gangs or the adult gangs or both? Well, primarily the, the youth gangs. Yeah. So what we saw, uh, we had a bad, you know, 10 days of, uh, of homicides. I think there's uh, six or seven homicides in the course of 10 days. And the average age of people who were shooting, getting shot, or being in the area when the shots are being fired was 13. And so what we were seeing the was... Average the average 13. age was 13. average age was 13. So there were obviously kids right. younger than that. Exactly. So we see um, this um, uh, proliferation of these youth gangs. Right. Uh, and, um, and we've had some uh, individuals with significant experience in bigger cities with dealing with gangs, and they were able to provide uh, a significant insight about what they were seeing. So we're starting to see more territorialism. We're starting to see more conflict. You're starting to see more, mm. rather than tagging, I mean, we've always had issues with graffiti. You're starting right. to see more uh, groups talking to each other and the symbols of disrespecting one group over the other. Uh, and then that manifested itself into some of the violence that we saw. Mm -hmm. um, overarch that with, uh, you know, you're talking about young kids who don't have, uh, you know, they, they came from a broken family. Um, they don't have any uh, problem solving skills. They've dropped out of school. Uh, they drop out of school. Um, they go to uh, violence very quickly. Mm -hmm. And the, um, the presence of firearms that are out and about in the criminal element is just overwhelming. And the great majority of those are stolen. Sure. And so we have, we have a lot of firearms. We have this youth uh, that can't deal, don't know how to deal uh, with, um, with uh, conflict. And the only way they know is to bring a firearm in and uh, start shooting. And, we, and that's what we were seeing. Uh, credit to the officers, uh, we really rallied up. Um, a dedicated a significant number of resources to get after the problem, uh, arrested a bunch of people. We've cleared almost all of those homicide cases that took place, made arrests. Great number of them were juveniles, mm -hmm. uh, which caused a problem because youth services, the juvenile detention facility, I think holds 23 tops. Oh. They have 18 that are in there for violent crimes or homicide. And so they have a capacity uh, uh, issue as well. So what happens then to these kids? Well, they, you know, fortunately, we, we were able to uh, make room for them. Okay. Um, actually, that was, it's a county facility. Uh, Scott Twido, our county attorney, worked very hard to do that. You know, frankly, these, these individuals have no regard for, for life or property. Um, they are a menace to society. I think what you, what you saw uh, happen in the jail um, a couple days ago, those are two individuals that we arrested for uh, for violent crimes. Right, and that's the type of mindset that you're that you're dealing with, and certainly not safe to be out in the community unsupervised. Well, now, what is the what is the uh, the mentality or the goal of gang members? You are uh, how is your status elevated within the gang, and what does that mean? Right, and there are. Um, books and books written about, uh, you know, the gang mentality, but essentially they're looking for um, inclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, they want to want to belong. Uh, and then it becomes respect. Uh, you uh -huh. need to respect me. And you have badges of honor. Um, you know, I met re recently met with with the group that talked about um, it's a badge of honor to get arrested. and It's a badge of honor to uh, assault or even kill somebody. Uh, that is a, uh, a very difficult mindset to deal with mm -hmm. or, or even understand, which is why our intervention and prevention programs are so critical at the front end, is that if I have a, a, a young individual that is looking for belonging, wants to be part of something, wants to be recognized, wants to be respected, wants to have um, you know, uh, some sort of standing, that that is not where to go for that. There are other programs, there's other um, avenues to go where you can get that and you're not gonna be 
um, you know, on the criminal element. And that, that's the thing that we, we try to break on the front end. It's well, very, very difficult. How do you get that message, though, to that individual? Right, and that's, that's where we engage our community. Um, okay. we, we have spent a lot of time, um, in, you know, trying to create programs, uh, and they're out there. Boys and Girls Club, for example, yeah. are, are ideal. Um, uh, big brothers and big sisters looking for mentors. Uh, you know the city's toying around with some with some mentorships, uh, and that's really what it is. If you have uh, and there's programs out there, every, everybody knows it. Um, you know we're just trying to steer this in uh, this individual misdirection rather than that direction is really what it is that we're trying to do. Now is that a police department function? Doesn't sound like it Does to me. Does not sound like it at all. <laughs> uh -huh. However, we're, we're critical, uh, especially on the intervention side. Our officers are dealing with these individuals all the time. Right. And specifically our school resource officers mm -hmm. are, are seeing them uh, um, at the school. And that's a prime opportunity to identify you know, you're you're dabbling on the dark side here. Let's mm -hmm. try this and get them into different programs or pay attention. And a lot of times that's all it takes. Uh, but that's what we're seeing in general. And then, of course, the violence manifested itself. Right. Uh, you know, generally, if one, one group goes after another, then there's got to be a retaliation. And that's what we're trying to, that's what we're yeah. trying to stop. And so uh, we moved some resources around. We uh, ramped up and changed our street crimes to do the gang mitigation. Uh, and we uh, engaged our federal and state partners and it was a full court press on this violent violence program, and um, and what you can see in our numbers is that again we were able to turn it down, make some arrests, um, hold these people accountable, and uh, provide some closure for the victims' families. What about prevention of uh, that child who has not yet stepped over to the dark side? Is is that now that's in cooperation with school district too as well, right? Yeah, and we were working uh, working hard to bring back the um, the dare. Uh, yeah, I remember well, that. So there's dare program, and then there's um, great G R E A T, which is gang resistance education training. Oh. Um, and so working with the school, and those are federal programs. Uh, you got to you know drink the Kool Aid to uh, follow their rules and stuff like that. So trying to get things set up or whatnot. But those are discussions that are being held at a very high level. To, um, to provide uh, that type of support, that type of intervention, that type of training at the youngest level. Now you're talking uh, you know, elementary school, middle school kids. Mm -hmm. And I really don't buy the argument that it's too late for the high schoolers or they're a lost cause. I don't, I don't buy that at all. Um, but we do have to get to them um, a, lot, a lot younger. Yeah. And again, um, it, it's gonna, it takes the community to, to buy into that. And there needs to be some stick to it with that because that's a lot of the problem is that everybody's like go 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 and then and yeah. then we back off yeah. for whatever reasons and so uh, so those are the things we're looking at. In the meantime, enforcement's enforcement. You know we're not yeah. uh, we're not tolerating uh, bad and illegal behavior. We get on it very quickly. Great support uh, from our county attorney, from our uh, U.S. attorney. Um, if possible, we're going to um, get them into the federal system. Mm -hmm. uh, because they do not have a capacity issue like uh, YCDF. Um, Would that take legislative action to get that type of criminal into the federal system? No, it's essentially the type of crime. Oh. Yeah, so robberies with a, with a firearm, um, felon in possession, for example. Okay. Um, you know, we, we ra uh, ramped up a, uh, a task force called Project Safe Neighborhood, P uh, PSN, you'll hear it referred to local, state, and federal all team up to go after the worst of the worst. And uh, in a lot of the things that you see in the media when someone shows up in the paper getting arrested and charged, mm -hmm. that's an effort of Project Safe Neighborhood Task Force. So it's wow. a, it is a great collaboration. Uh, the teamwork among all agencies here in Yellowstone County is, is exceptional. We don't have any turf problems. Yeah. Um, there's plenty of work uh, to go around. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, a lot of times all we argue about is who's got to do the paperwork. Uh, <laughs> but for the most part, yeah. when it's time to go to work, they go to work. Right. And we get a lot of stuff done. I'm wondering about other communities in Montana. Do they have similar problems? Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of my frustrations is, um, you know, it, it just seems like that 
uh, Billings is the epicenter of, uh, of all this, uh, you know, heinous activity. We have anarchy here and, uh, you know, things are running amok. But our sister cities have exactly the same thing. Gangs? Um, they, they have gangs, They've got gang too? issues. They have the homicides. They've got officer-involved shooting. It just doesn't get, it just doesn't get okay. the coverage here as, as ours do, which, which is, you know, is appropriate. However, you know, for 10 days in a row, you see the same headline. Right. And then what that does to the citizens is like, yeah, you know what, they must be right, is, is that we, you know, that we, uh, we're living in anarchy here well, and we're out of control. And that's not the case. I mean, we, uh, the, the violent crimes that we see, the great majority, 99%, uh, everybody knows each other, there's a relationship. Mm -hmm. We have very little random acts of violence. Mm -hmm. um, you know, our property crimes, uh, you know, the burglaries are down, the vehicle thefts are down. Uh, we spoke a little bit off uh, off mic here about our shoplifting issue. Yeah, which that is, seems to be huge. It is. It is. And again, what it was um, a, a result of a uh, um, a good effort um, and well intended effort to reduce uh, the load on our jail system and the criminal justice uh, by backing off, uh, lowering the standards on some of our misdemeanor crimes. Uh, things that we can uh, make arrests for. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it, it was quite the opposite. It exacerbated the problem uh, because the criminals aren't stupid. They know they're not going to go to jail, and if they don't hit a felony amount, uh, then they're going to get a traffic ticket. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at our statistics, um, year in and year out, the number, when you, you look at about 50 to 60 percent of all the arrests that we make, mm -hmm. they are all violations of uh, court orders or their non-appearance warrants. Yeah. So these are these are individuals that have been arrested and they didn't show up for court. They didn't follow the judge's rules. Uh, they uh, they violated probation uh, um, rules, yeah. things like that. But when you break that down and look at administrative violations, 50, 60 percent of all arrests that we made are people that we've already arrested before. <laughs> And so when we talk yeah. about re-engaging right. the justice system, uh, we're now, there's a little bit more room in the jail. The sheriff's been great working with us. Uh, federal system's taking what they can. Our judges, we're getting people in front of judges now, holding them accountable. Um, all of the uh, providers on the back end, so those that are uh, providing the ankle bracelets and the monitoring are fully engaged and helping. And you're starting to see the effect that those numbers are going down because it's like, oh yeah, I can go to jail. There is a consequence Yeah, I can this. go to jail. Yeah. Uh, and so again, it's not, the, it's not a panacea. We're certainly uh, continuing to work with the legislature mm -hmm. um, on tightening that up a little bit. Uh, I think they realize it too. And, and again, we're not the only thing. I just saw a, uh, an article out of Missoula, shoplifting's off the rails up there. Mm -hmm. You know, same type of thing. But, well, you mentioned a dollar amount to me earlier. What was stolen in Billings, shoplifted? Yeah, so one of the big box stores hit a million dollar loss in a one year. One store? One store, yeah. Wow. So you have, um, yeah, I mean, you have people, everybody's seen them. So everyone's seen them on YouTube, and you've probably been at the store and watched people load up a shopping cart and just walk th walk out the door. Um, you know, the, we're, the, uh, the stores have policies. Uh, where they're not mm -hmm. confronting them, they might stop them and uh, or try to stop them. We ask people to be a good witness, get us um, some identif identifying uh, features. We do follow up on those, uh, but at the end of the day, we're not getting everybody, and it's costing those businesses a significant amount of money, which yeah. of course, in turn, gets uh, handed back to the consumer. Hmm. Uh, there is a task force dealing with organized retail crime. Um, it has uh, state agents assigned to it. Uh, we are a member of that group. It's organized shoplifting? O organized retail crime association is what it called, ORCA, as you know. Wow. We, as you know, we like our, our acronyms. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, because it's not just the person going in to steal a six pack of beer. We got that. But we have people going in and stealing um, 
you know, a whole basket full of uh, Makita power tools, for example, because that's what their handlers ordered up, and they're trading it for drugs, for guns, for money. I see. So it's organized. It's organized. And so, you know, those are things to, uh, you know, to, to be mindful of. There's, but even at that, again, last few years, we've been able to turn the numbers to a downward trend, uh, which means our strategies, which we put in place, mm -hmm. uh, utilizing the resources we got from not one, but two safety levies uh, mm -hmm. that the citizens uh, uh, allowed us. Uh, are making a difference. Right. And so, and then the strategies were very simple. We wanted to get a handle on violent crime. We wanted to improve the uh, reality or the perception of public safety in the downtown area. And then we wanted to uh, continue our work on traffic enforcement. The fourth objective was to support our partners with the mental health issue. Uh, that ended up becoming a uh, city administration uh, initiative and uh, a lot of that landed with the fire department. That program has made a significant impact uh, for us as well. Mm -hmm. But those are the three objectives. Uh, they're as good now as they were uh, three years ago when yeah. the safety levy passed. And um, you know we just need to tweak them, um, adjust our tactics. Uh, we're adding resources. City Council just gave us additional uh, resources you're, for that. Yeah, you're adding some officers, right? We are. Uh, yeah, and it was uh, an interesting debate. Um, I originally, uh, keeping in mind there's no new money. Right. There's no new money coming in. I'd made a request for uh, three officers a year um, over five years and some support staff for a total of 15, which puts us in the ballpark of where we should be um, for officers on the street. Now keep in mind, I don't need 16 officers on the street at four o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Okay. So we need to put them where the work is. But that put us in the ballpark. Um, council uh, wanted better than that. And so at the end of all the council subcommittee meetings and the uh, budget approval meeting, uh, police department was um, authorized eight sworn officers three community service officers, which are has been a wildly successful program, yeah. and then one crime analyst. So a total of 12 new FTEs coming the police department way with all the stuff that goes with them, mm -hmm. vehicles mm -hmm. and equipment, uh, with, with the no new money. Now we weren't the only ones. Fire got some, some personnel, code enforcement, uh, attorneys, and municipal court really is the public safety side. So the underlying message from council, uh, loud and clear, is we want an increased officer presence. Okay, that's what we want. We want more cops. More we want more yeah. visible, uh, more visibility. And second of all, we want to be, uh, position the department to address this family family violent situation mm -hmm. across the board and support what um, what is called a family justice center. Okay. which is essentially a one-stop shopping for family violence victims. You have, uh, you have police there, you have um, counselors, you have uh, medical, mm -hmm. you have mental health worker, all of that. It's one-stop shopping because, uh, as we indicated before, um, you know, it's difficult to prevent on the front end. Right. So, the, so we, what we really want to do is, is serve the victims on the back end so we can minimize trauma, uh, make sure we're holding our suspects accountable and helping them through the system. How much of that goes unreported, do you think, domestic violence? Uh, I, I, think, uh, I don't think as much as people think. I mean, I've heard some pretty wild numbers that uh, you know, 50% of the people aren't gonna call because you're not gonna do anything or they won't be held accountable. You know, we had over 93,000 calls for service, so I don't think people mm -hmm. are hesitant to call the police, and that's why we're here uh, to, to right. do that. Obviously, there's, you know, there's some calls there that you probably don't need to send police officers to. And I, again, I think um, I, during the school year, I routinely hear, you know, they're sending two officers with all the stuff to somebody's house because their second grader won't get out of bed and go to school. You know, that's, there, that's a statement there about, you know, parenting skills and where can, oh, yeah. we, where can we support the parent to help, to help those decisions and help uh, through those situations. 
And so in the meantime, I'm sending two police officers there to rouse this kid out of bed. Well, then what happens with the kid? The kid's got a bad impression of the police department. Sure. You know, and then we deal with that. Uh, and so part of those 93,000 calls are, are some of those. But, you know, you go Do you have to go? Do you have to respond to a call like that? We pretty much do. Yeah. Really? It seems like not a police issue at all. Right. Right. And, and sometimes, I mean, depending on how busy we are, um, you know, it's going to be deferred. Or once in a while, uh, the supervisor is going to jump in and whatever the circumstances yeah. are and say, we're not going there. Right, okay. Uh, but for the most part, and, and this is really, you know, one of the one of the blessings of living in Billings. When you call for a cop, you're going to get one. You're going to get one, Most yeah. of the time. And this goes back to, you know, when I started, it didn't matter what was going on. Um, you know, you got it. My neighbor ran over my hose. Okay, here come the police officer. <laughs> okay. So the sprinkler is in my yeah. hand. All right. I mean, so we're, we're starting to have to, um, because of the nature of the calls and how busy we are, we're starting to have to prioritize. And that community service officer program that mm -hmm. I indicated uh, has saved, uh, they went on two, 3,000 calls that we didn't have to send a police officer. Nice. And they have saved hundreds of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the three new ones that are coming on board will give us a total of 10. Oh, we are able to handle seven days a week from seven in the morning to nine at night. Okay. Okay. Right now it's seven to seven, and I don't want them work any later than that because they're not armed. They're not police officers. Right. Or, right. You know, so, but yeah. but a great great program. In the minute and a half that we have left, I'm wondering on a timeline for this family resource center, is there a goal in mind? Yeah, that, um, you know, we're working very closely with our partners at the YWCA. Good. Um, they really are uh, kind of the point of contact for getting things going. Mm -hmm. uh, possibly have a location. They have a, they have a uh, facility there that's not in use, so that would be the off-site. I mean, you don't want to have it at the police department. No. Uh, so that would be the off-site. I already have uh, investigators assigned to a domestic violence unit. Uh, with the additional resources and restructuring of our detectives business model, I will now augment that and be in a better position to support. Uh, but Lynn, as I said, it is not a police department initiative. We are part of it. Right. It is, a, it is the community that needs to come right. together with all of those resources, make sure that they are sustained mm -hmm. and that, that we stick to this, to this program. So, uh, that's underway right now. There's a lot of discussion on the police department side. You know, we're in it yeah. and poised to expand it. Sounds like a positive move. Yeah, very, very much so. And it's needed. If we can break that yeah. cycle of violence yeah. and turn those numbers down, then, uh, then we're doing well. Okay. Well, I want to thank you for being here, Chief. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Your City. I'm your host, Lynn Turner Fitzgerald. I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.